discussing the new movie Jurassic World Dominion coming out tomorrow in all theaters. It's out in New York today, so I'll be seeing it soon. Um, but my colleague Laura Gegel and I, we talked with some amazing paleontologists uh, this past week uh, about the movie. And so I wanted to show you guys those interviews now. Enjoy. We are joined by okay. Kenneth Lacovara. He's the founding dean and professor at the School of Earth and Environment, as well as the founding director at the Jean and Rick Edelman Fossil Park and Museum at Rowan University. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you. It's a pleasure. All right. I'm so excited to talk with you because your dinosaur that you helped discover is one of the one of the largest titanosaurs that we know of that's so complete. And when did you discover that this dinosaur would be depicted in the movie? Um, it was, I think, last summer. Uh, I got a tip off from Steve Brutzel, message uh, on the down low uh, that Dreadnoughtus was going to be in the movie. And um, I was unreasonably happy about that. I was kind of doing the, you know, 10 year old dinosaur boy dance around the living room when I found that out. <laughs> yeah, everyone at Live Science was cheering for you. All I right. know you um, you haven't seen the movie yet, but from the little bit that you can see, what do you think of how they depicted it? I really like this. This particular shot, um, I think, is really quite accurate as far as the anatomy of Dreadnoughtus. Um, I really like how uh, muscular the legs are and you can see those wide sternal plates there separating the chest uh, they had a very wide gauge stance um, I like also how the body is mostly parallel with the ground which I think is is your um, kind of at home posture for these kinds of creatures so it looks massive it looks powerful it doesn't look particularly friendly uh, this is how I imagine dreadnoughtus to be yeah and I know Dreadnoughtus is uh, kind of enjoying the spotlight lately. Can you tell me a little bit about um, the discovery and excavation of its fossil? Sure. Um, I found Dreadnoughtus down at the bottom of South America, at the bottom of Patagonia uh, in 2005. And we worked down there for uh, five field seasons to excavate this giant. Uh, we ended up um, excavating and jacketing and removing 145 giant bones, as you can see there on the screen. Uh, some of them weighed more than cars. And we were out there, for the most part, without any mechanized equipment at the end of a field season. I could usually get a front end loader to the site for a day or two. But usually we're moving these bones with um, just hand power, power and pulleys and winches and things like that. And it was just a, an amazing and a backbreaking excavation in a very remote part of the world. We were uh, about four hours um, on dirt roads and then no roads uh, from the nearest little town. And uh, I spent uh, over a year of my life living in a tent uh, next to Dreadnoughtus. Yeah, lucky for us. Um, let's talk about the name. It's just a wonderful name. How did you and your colleagues pick it out? Well, I think of naming a dinosaur as, um, no pun intended, as a very weighty responsibility. <laughs> um, and really, when you think about it, like our ancestors, right, me at the time, were these little tiny shrew-like creatures living in the hidden and forgotten recesses of the dinosaur world, hoping never to be noticed. And then we evolve into these sentient beings that do things like paleontology. And now the legacy of this whole other species is in my hands or another paleontologist's hands or whoever is describing that animal. And, you know, this is an animal dreadnoughtus that lived under its own auspices and, and evolved in a very, you know, hard knock world and lived for millions of years as a species. And now I have to, you know, somehow support its legacy. And so I've always been bothered that these large herbivores are so often portrayed as like these dopey, passive plant eaters just kind of wallowing around in the mud with some salad hanging out of their mouths, waiting for a T-Rex to come up and take a bite out of them. That's not how they are. And, you know, if you think of the world today, what are the most dangerous animals to humans? Well, it's, it's elephants, it's hippos, it's rhinos, it's water buffalo, it's bison. The big herbivores, they don't want to eat you. They just want to kill you. Um, because they're surly and territorial. So Dreadnoughtus, 65 tons, 
um, imagine a big bull dreadnoughtus in the breeding season defending a territory. It would be a fearsome creature. Itself would have nothing to fear, so dreadnought fears nothing, which I thought really um, was a way to honor the uh, legacy and success and ferocity of, of these animals. I did actually want to show you this. <laughs> My neighbor is like, what's Dreadnoughtus? I know about the ship. <laughs> oh, you and, found a Dreadnought picture. Mm -hmm. You know, as with most wonderful things in this world, Star Wars. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just love it's like, oh, no, it's a dinosaur. It's a really, you know, well-known dinosaur. And he's like, oh, you mean Star Wars. <laughs> well, the, the battleships were part of the inspiration for the name Dreadnoughtus. And, and in the scientific paper that describes the species, um, I actually mentioned in there that it's that its name was inspired by two Argentinian dreadnoughts that existed around the turn of the last century, uh, the ARA uh, Moreno and the ARA Rivadavia. And those those ships were built um, in Camden, New Jersey, across from Philadelphia, where I was working on dreadnoughts and taking to Argentina. So I thought that was a good idea. That's Crazy. a great science, full circle. Because <laughs> didn't you ship the bones back up to your lab on a, on a boat? I did, yeah. I, I shipped them from uh, Rio de Janeiro, the third most southern city in the world. They made a bunch of stops. I was up all night long during those weeks on shipbreaker.com watching Dreadnoughta sail up the Atlantic. And I uh, had them in my lab, in actually three labs for about five years, and then sent them all back home on a ship and went down to this little uh, dockside bar on the Delaware Bay and had a beer and literally watched Dreadnoughta. <laughs> Horizon. Wow. Oh man. It's definitely full circle. Trinata yeah. Sun Trinata. Yeah, it's so appropriate. I wonder if the name helped catch the attention of uh, Jurassic World Dominion. I'm sure that there are going to be kids watching Jurassic World Dominion who are going to become paleontologists or scientists because of these films, which is amazing. Um, are they textbooks? No, they're not. Um, so, you know, don't get your science from these sources, but certainly get your inspiration from them. These uh, the CGI animations are just unbelievable and really inspiring for me. And, you know, hopefully this will stimulate people's interest and then they'll go to the actual sources to, to find the information. I always talk about the Jurassic World movies as, you know, these are fun summer monster movies. That's what they are supposed to be. And, and they do a great job at that. So, you know, I, I, I'm i not one of those paleontologists that's going to nitpick every little detail that might not be correct in the dinosaurs because, you know, this isn't a documentary. This isn't a textbook. It's a monster movie. And they're great. And they do a, a great job of inspiring the next generation. Yeah, I was going to say they're a great jumping off point. And I don't think I've been in a movie theater since the COVID pandemic started, but I think I might go for, <laughs> for Jurassic World Dominion. Yay, movie yeah, night. I've got my tickets for Thursday the 9th. Ah, oh, that's great. So that was Dr. Dr. Kenneth Akovara. We've had him on before to talk about his book years ago, and he's a delight. I love having his expertise on that. Let's talk about dinosaurs. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I'll be having my colleague Laura on to advise on such matters, unless I feel confident enough to uh, say something. But uh, for now, we're going to uh, watch the next interview, which is with uh, Steve Rosetta, who uh, was actually an advisor on the movie. Enjoy. Today, we're joined by Dr. Steve Rossetti. He's a paleontologist at the University of Edinburgh. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Really excited to talk to dinosaurs and mammals and films and books uh, with, uh, with you, Laura, and with you, Judy. So pop culture now, we're so hot and trendy. Yeah, Steve has authored more than 150 scientific papers about prehistoric animals. And he wrote the New York Times bestseller in the rise and fall of the dinosaurs and his new book, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals just came out. So we're so lucky to have him. And he's also the scientific advisor for the Jurassic World Dominion movie. So you've been really busy. Been busy. It's been a whirlwind couple of weeks, and I'm joining you from uh, Los Angeles. I'm here for the film premiere, uh, which has just happened, which was a whole lot of fun, and some uh, press and publicity, and some outreach events. There's a big outreach event we did uh, about the film 
for high school students uh, the other night, 350 high school students from across the country. They're all going to be the first in their families to go to college. So uh, they they got this trip to come out to California and go to Universal Studios and see the film and meet some of the actors. And they had me along to talk dinosaurs with them. So it's been really surreal seeing all this stuff. Then the book comes out today. You see the book behind me. So I'm in full book marketing mode. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a few weeks of not real life here as a scientist. <laughs> Normally I'm in the classroom, I'm teaching, I'm in the lab, I'm digging up dinosaurs, which is really cool. All that stuff is cool, but uh, doing all this work recently, um, pop cultural stuff has been a whole lot of fun. And I think it's always fun to just bring the science that we do to audiences, different audiences, um, uh, whether through books or films, uh, however we do it. Yeah, actually it was your first book, was that caught the attention of the um of the Jurassic World franchise? Like, how did they reach out to you to ask you to be an advisor on the movie? It, it was really random and really funny, and it definitely was kind of a right place, right time kind of thing. So the, the book you mentioned, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, I, I published that one in 2018. Uh, and you guys, you know, very generously uh, at the time, you know, we, we did a video and interview and stuff. So you guys helped get that off the ground, uh, live science. and. Um, and so uh, the book came out uh, a little bit before the, the last Jurassic World film. Um, my editor is very savvy. He wanted the book to come out around the time this big dinosaur blockbuster was hitting theaters. Uh, and so uh, a few months after the film came out, I got an email uh, from a guy purporting to be Colin Trevorrow, a name I recognize you know, immediately as a director of Jurassic World. And the subject line was just, I read your book. And if you remember from the the first Jurassic Park, there's this snotty little kid who goes up to Alan Grant, Sam Neill's character, and says, I read your book. <laughs> and so God, he put that in the subject. And then he said, hey, uh, my name's Colin. I make scientifically inaccurate dinosaur films. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to be up in Edinburgh. And I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, and that's where I teach. Uh, and so he said, I'm going to be up in Edinburgh. Do you want to meet up and talk dinosaurs? So I thought this was some some kind of hoax. I thought one of my students or something was just playing a trick on me. And uh, so I had the, you know, uh, book people look into it and they came back and they said, yeah, that's him. That's the email he uses. So, okay. So I responded and then we got on the phone and it really was him. And he did come up to Edinburgh for the Fringe Festival with his family. Um, and, uh, you know, like me, Colin is an American guy who's moved, you know, to the UK with his family. So I think there was, you know, just he read the book, the book came out the right time. I was living in the UK. I think he wanted somebody to talk to locally. Um, and he basically laid it on the line. He said, uh, when I first met him, he said, look, I'm starting to write the next film. Uh, I want to put in a bunch of new dinosaurs and I want to put in some feathered dinosaurs finally. And that's something we've all been pining for, you know, in the paleontology world, put feathers on some of these Jurassic Park dinosaurs. So once he told me that, I said, oh, my God, I'd love to help out. And so I've been, you know, working with him since, working with him and uh, the artists making the dinosaurs, just to try to make them as realistic as possible within the confines of a blockbuster film. So do we want to <laughs> mention this again? Because uh, I know you talk about Colin a lot, but it's, it's nice to uh, acknowledge our, our past mistakes. Yeah, you know, there there were reasons, uh, you know, for, for not having the feathered dinosaurs in the earlier films, uh, but, you know, the time was right for now. They do uh, explain that in the film, uh, why we're seeing feathered dinosaurs now. And in the, I'll just say, in the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World universe, that explanation makes sense sense. And you, and you got to think of these, these are, it's like the Marvel universe, you know, I mean, this is kind of, you know, a world onto itself. There's reasons for different things, but I'm just very happy uh, that we do have feathers on the dinosaurs, uh, on some of the dinosaurs. And this is Jen Wanlong. This is when I described a few years ago with my dear uh, friend who sadly passed away a few years ago, Jin Chong Lu, who was one of China's great dinosaur hunters. But mm. this is a real feathered dinosaur. There's the fossil. Um, you can see the feathers. You can see the wings on the arms. This was a raptor. You know, this was a very close cousin of Velociraptor. Look at that wing. And so when people ask me, you know, are these feathered dinosaurs real? I show them photos like this. I say, these are real fossils. You can see the feathers yourself. I've studied these things. I've described them. Like, I assure you, you know, these things are real. And you look at a picture like that. And if you didn't know what you were looking at, you'd be like, oh, that's some kind of dead bird. <laughs> you know, so... That, those are the real raptors, and I'm glad that um, moviegoers around the world will get to get to see that. Yeah, and it's so fun to like watch the movie and then see what the science is that it's based on. I always get a thrill out of that. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Us plebeians can be on y'all's level now. <laughs> I'm really curious about how the back and forth occurred. Like, would he run a scenario by you or show you images? How did it work? It was in practice, it was a lot of emails and phone calls. It was a lot of questions. It was a lot of chats. You know, I mean, I didn't I didn't help write the film. I didn't come up with storylines or plot lines. I didn't decide what dinosaurs were in there. I didn't help edit the film. None of that. You know, those are the the the, the Hollywood, you know, movie magic creative genius people doing that work. For me, I was just always on call to answer their questions. Anytime they wanted to know something about a dinosaur, how big was this dinosaur? How would it have moved? What colors might it have been? You know, what kind of environment might it have lived in? Those those kind of questions. Uh, I would answer those questions. Um, other times, you know, a lot of times the artists, people like Kevin Jenkins, David Vickery, you know, the people behind a lot of the art, um, and it's both digital art, CGI art, but there's a lot of animatronics and puppets. So all three um, to types of things in the film for the dinosaurs. But they would uh, design, be designing characters. Uh, they would show me drafts of what they were doing. They were, they would ask me, is this on the right track? Is this looking, you know, correct? Is there anything egregiously wrong? Or sometimes they would say, oh, we're trying to make this kind of soft tissue. We know there's no fossils for it. Is this realistic? So a lot of questions like that. Um, and even some some funny ones. So I mean, I got a phone call. I was actually, I think I was working on the mammal book. I was you know at home just <laughs> typing out one of these chapters about whales or something. I can't remember exactly, but I was definitely doing the book. And I you know a phone phone message pops up and it's it's Colin. I see Colin's name flash on the phone. Okay, I better, I better take this one. And he says, Hey Steve, I'm here on the set. And uh, Mamadou is one of the actors. He plays a, a, a really awesome new character. He says, Mamadou's about to say the name of this dinosaur. And the way he pronounces it is going to dictate how we say it <laughs> throughout the entire film. So we got to get it right. And it's the dinosaur Giganotosaurus, the, the new movie monster, the new villain in the film, you know, bigger than T-Rex. And so it was really funny because I had to tell Colin, I, I had to be that guy. Uh, and I had to say, well, actually, uh, there's two ways you can pronounce it. It's, uh, I say it one way. Other scientists say it another. I say you should call it Giganotosaurus, uh, which they did. So there were moments of levity like that. I did get, you know, I visited the set. Now, there were very strict COVID protocols because they were filming right in the heart of the pandemic, the, the early stages. But I got to visit the set. I got to meet a lot of people, a lot of the actors. So it was just a really um, totally surreal experience to be part of it. Okay. Yep. So here we got. Yeah, this is a dinosaur called Parasaurolophus, and there's Chris Pratt on horseback <laughs> wrangling them, um, as one does. Uh, <laughs> but this was a duck-billed dinosaur. They lived in the late Cretaceous. They had that big crest of bone on their head. That was actually a resonating chamber that connected to the nasal passages. So a, a good friend of mine, Tom Williamson, who I work with in New Mexico, is actually one of the world's leading mammal experts. But he studies dinosaurs and. Uh, several years back, Tom uh, CAT scanned a skull of uh, Parasaurolophus, and they used software that he worked with physicists, kind of using some of the methods that instrument makers use when they're designing instruments to simulate what kind of sound it would make. And this thing would have had this kind of trumpeting sound that came from that crest. Uh, whether you could pet one like that uh, without it getting too aggressive, I don't know. But Chris Pratt is superhuman, so um, he could probably Actually, do Actually, I love that. It's in a snowy landscape. What do we know about <clears throat> dinosaurs living in the Arctic? Yeah, that's that, that, that's that's a good point. Like, this isn't normally the the imagery we think of when, when we see dinosaur art. You know, whether it's it's paintings of prehistoric scenes or museum exhibits or films, you're almost always seeing dinosaurs like in the tropics or subtropics or in jungles and there's volcanoes and you know there's lots of ferns and there's lots of greenery. You don't normally see dinosaurs in the snow. Um, they, there would have been some dinosaurs that did live in the snow. I mean, the earth was much warmer back in the Jurassic and Cretaceous um, when you know most of these movie dinosaurs lived, but there were no ice caps at that time. Uh, but above the Arctic Circle and even close to the Arctic Circle, I mean, it would have been cold, especially during the winter months. So some dinosaurs would have had to deal with snow. And, and we, have, we have fossils of dinosaurs from Alaska, for instance, that lived above the Arctic Circle. There's ways you can tell from the rocks, the temperature, and we can tell that you know those temperatures would have gotten below freezing. So yes, some of these dinosaurs would have had to uh, deal with snow. Probably maybe not as much snow as like I did gr growing up in Chicago, but you know some snow. Some snow. Okay. 
so here, yeah, so th now these are the raptors. And, you know, these are the um, kind of, you know, genetically altered raptors. That's Blue and Blue's baby, which is named Beta. Oh, and so, yeah. you know, they're, they're velociraptors. They're, you know, but these ones are not real, proper, completely uh, accurate dinosaurs. There's intentionally some, not just movie magic with these, but part of the storyline of the entire Jurassic World, you know, trilogy is... Um, those genetically modified raptors. And it's a big part of this storyline. So beta, that character is, is a big part of the story arc. Yeah, um, actually, it looks like the the parent is kind of like watching out for its offspring. What, what do we yeah. know about like parental behavior and raptors or other dinosaurs? We know that some dinosaurs were very good parents uh, and, we, and fossils tell us that. So first of all, fossils tell us that all dinosaurs, as far as we know, laid eggs. And those eggs were usually pretty small. I don't think there's ever been a dinosaur egg that's been found that's bigger than like, you know, a, a, a football or something. Even that's getting really big. So even the biggest dinosaurs of all, the brontosauruses and the dreadnoughtuses, like in the film, that's the, the long neck one. I mean, they would have hatched from small eggs. There's dreadnoughtus right there. Um, and, uh, and a fun fact about dreadnoughtus, by the way, it was discovered on an expedition by uh, a friend of mine, Ken Lacavera, uh, and his colleagues in Argentina. That expedition was funded through what's called the Jurassic Foundation. It's a charitable organization that uh, Universal donated a lot of money to over the years, proceeds from the film actually supporting the science. So that dinosaur wouldn't be known if it wasn't for Jurassic Park in a roundabout way, the film funding the dig. Anyway, uh, parental care. Uh, some dinosaurs like the big long neck dinosaurs probably didn't have much parental care at all. I mean, if you imagine an animal the size of a, a, a jet plane sitting on a nest, like it's just, you know, it just wouldn't happen. But a lot of the smaller dinosaurs, the ones that had feathers, the ones that were very bird-like, they did care for their young. We actually have fossil parents sitting on their nests, protecting their eggs, very sadly, protecting their eggs from like sandstorms and floods that ended up burying them. Um, and But the way they're sitting on the nests, the way uh, that their posture is, the way that the arms are, are folded out covering the eggs, is just exactly like modern birds do it. Uh, we're not totally sure if those are mother or father dinosaurs, by the way. Uh, you, you know, you probably assume they're mothers. A lot of people would, but there's a lot of birds where fathers do a lot of care and others where, you know, both parents do. So we don't really know. What we do know, though, is that those dinosaur parents, and these are things like some of the oviraptor type dinosaurs, they, they were very good parents. Steve, I saw you had a tweet the other day saying that you thought they did a pretty good job with the anatomy. So, you know, this dinosaur is in the film. It's Moros is what it's called. It's a tiny little tyrannosaur. It's basically a T-Rex ancestor or T-Rex cousin. Um, it was the size of like a, you know, little puppy dog. It's a really cute character and it plays a small but important role uh, in the film. And this dinosaur, it was a real dinosaur. It was discovered a few years ago. It was named by a friend of mine, Lindsay Zano, who's a an outstanding paleontologist, a great discoverer of dinosaurs. She's a curator uh, down in North Carolina. Um, and uh, I know Lindsay is very excited that her dinosaur is going to be in the film. How would you compare it to the previous movies? Well, you know, there's there's a lot of dinosaurs and other things like this thing on the screen here, this huge mosasaur. I mean, that's not a dinosaur, um, but it's a you know a reptile cousin of dinosaurs. There's pterodactyls, you know, pterosaurs in the film that are also not dinosaurs. There's a few early mammals actually, and so in the Rise and Reign of the Mammals in the new book, I talk about two of these mammals. There's a Dimetrodon in the film, and there's a Lystrosaurus. Dimetrodon is that one with the sail on its back. It looks like a dinosaur, but it's actually an early relative of ours. It's more closely related to us than it is to dinosaurs. And then Lystrosaurus was this little thing that lived after the end Permian extinction, cute little thing. Anyway, there's lots of characters, lots of new characters. They're not all dinosaurs. Um, and generally they're pretty good. There's Pyroraptor here. This is one of the new villains. And this is a proper raptor. You know, this is what raptors really would have looked like. Uh, they would have had feathers all over their bodies. They would have had wings on their arms. Uh, just terrifying it like you know imagine a, a turkey or a ostrich or something but even more terrifying you know running after you so i think um you know by and large i really like the dinosaurs yes there's some inaccuracies you know some of those things are because the original jurassic park nearly 30 years ago established a look a design um that it basically has become a brand you know so so there's certain things you know they're not just going to put feathers all over the t-rex let's say you know that just wouldn't really work in the Jurassic, you know, universe. Um, but for a blockbuster movie, I think these dinosaurs are, are really good. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, you know, uh, 
Star Wars. I mean, do they get all the astrophysics right? No, really not. It's a blockbuster movie. So here I think what Jurassic Park and Jurassic World have always done is they have a really high bar. And even if these dinosaurs might not be exactly 100% in line with every single fossil or um, if they're not, you know, maybe at the same level as things that are done in an actual nature documentary or science documentary, for a blockbuster movie to have this quality, to me, that's really astounding. And also very important because, you know, moviegoers around the world are seeing pretty realistic dinosaurs. Yeah, I, um, I had a question about a scene that's coming up. So let's, let's see this trailer to the finish. <laughs> okay, let me, let me do this. Here we go. Okay, this is the Therizinosaur. This is a great scene. Um, Bryce Dallas Howard uh, confronts and counters this dinosaur, and it's a big dinosaur with feathers. And uh, it's terrifying. It has claws that are like a meter long, like three of these meter long claws on each arm. Like imagine like a giant sloth, like these kind of claws. And yeah, the body's big. This thing weighed several tons, big pot belly and covered in feathers, ferocious thing, uh, but it's a plant eater. And that's part of the storyline. And it, it turns out to play a really key role in the story. But this is one of the new dinosaurs. This is being shown uh, in, in a Jurassic film for the very first time. It's one that right away Colin told me about early on. He said, I want to get a Therizinosaurus in there. And I said, yes, I, people are going to love this. These are some of the weirdest dinosaurs of all. You know, people are going to watch this and not, you know, and, and think that these things are totally made up. There can't possibly have been an animal that looked like that. But these things are real. We find their fossils in the Gobi Desert. And, and this scene here that's alluded to in the trailer is, you know, one of my favorite scenes in the film. And, and, uh, Bryce uh, Dallas Howard, uh, who's very nice, by the way, uh, spent a lot of time with her at the at the uh, outreach event the other night. So she was there um, inspiring the students. Uh, but uh, this scene, I think, is, is her strongest. It's a great, great piece of acting and a really, really great piece of acting by the dinosaur, too, I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> We're racing to the extinction of our species. So those are claws, not feathers. Yeah. Those are claws on the arms, yeah. Mm -hmm. They look kind of like feathers, like some big streaming feathers, but those are claws. There's feathers on the rest of the body. So, and are they fast like sloths? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot we don't know about Therizinosaurus because the fossils are very limited. We have fossils of those claws. So some of those claws have just been found on their own, like the hand. But there's not a lot of fossils of the rest of the body. We have enough to generally know what it looks like but as far as knowing like how fast it could move really really iffy cool very cool i like how they camouflaged it with the forest yeah yep oh everybody's showing up again and you're seeing all the actors you know everybody everything comes full circle in the film oh here we go okay yeah so there's pyro raptor on the ice there's Chris and Dewanda. That's Dewanda Wise. She's going to be the breakout star. She's an awesome person, incredible actress, and a lot of fun. We've been bantering a lot about the last few days about which ones are and aren't dinosaurs. So I had to break the news to Dewanda at our STEM event the other night that when she said her favorite dinosaur is Quetzalcoatlus, it's because of this scene where she's flying a plane and the Quetzalcoatlus is attacked. I had to butt in and say, oh, sorry, Dewanda, they pay me to be the science advisor on this thing. I got to tell you, it's not a dinosaur. <laughs> she couldn't believe it. But My colleagues always get me on that. I'm literally <laughs> on this one. <laughs> but yeah, this is Quetzalcoatlus. It's the largest flying animal that ever lived, as far as we know. Its wingspan was somewhere in the 10 to 12 meter range. You know, we're talking about 35 to 40 feet. So this is like bigger than a fighter jet. Um, and, and here it is, you know, attacking the plane that Dewanda's character uh, is, is flying. And <laughs> Chris Pratt's character is in the plane, too. Bryce's character, as you can see, is parachuted out. But, um, but it's an awesome scene. Uh, and it really conveys to me um, just the size and the strength and the power of these pterosaurs. I mean, the pterosaurs are extinct. They went extinct when the asteroid hit, you know, with the dinosaurs. So there's nothing alive today like them. Um, they're one of only three groups of, of animals with bones that have ever evolved proper powered flapping flight with birds and bats being the other. So pterosaurs are the only one of those three that's extinct. So, you know, they, they're so weird. They're so alien. They're so otherworldly. And they got to be so big, so much bigger than any flying bird 
or any bat. And I think these scenes convey just how enormous these animals were. And yeah, if they were if you were in a plane and you were flying around with these things, um, you probably wouldn't want to be in their airspace. <laughs> I did read a, a critique online saying that maybe this pterosaur couldn't fly with uh, such long distances, given its its uh, great size. But it's nice to take liberties in a monster movie. Yeah, though. I mean, there there is good evidence for me that they could fly. There has been debate, you know, could they be secondarily flightless? Are they like pterosaur versions of ostriches because they're so big? But there's been some cool research that you know people like Mike Habib, who's a a friend of mine who's an expert on, on pterosaur flight. Um, and other people like, you know, Darren Nation, and Mark Witten, and, you know, some of, some of the real pterosaur experts have studied these things. And they, they think that these pterosaurs, even though they were so big, they could still fly and they could fly well. And we find bones of giant pterosaurs in the late Cretaceous, not only in North America where Quetzalcoatlus is, but there's a bunch of them in Europe. There's a bunch of them from Romania where I do a lot of field work. There's a, one called Hatsegopteryx. And so it seems like they probably had pretty big ranges. You know, they, they probably could sail on those wings for very long distances. So I, I think really they probably were pretty good flyers. Nice. Well, then uh, more accuracy than I realized. <laughs> Anybody else show up at the end? Oh, gosh. Oh, Triceratops. This is just a veritable who's who of dinosaurs. Well, you got all the classics, you know, oh. and there's, oh, yeah. Not, you know, there's Dilophosaurus coming back, one of the villains from the first film with that crazy frill. There is no scientific evidence that it had that frill. That is movie magic, you know, that's based on some lizards and some other things. This is, goes back to Crichton and Spielberg and their vision. Awesome movie monster. Probably didn't have that frill, but it did have the two crests of bone on his head and it had big, sharp teeth. It would have been really terrifying. Um, it probably did not spit venom either, but, you know, again, that's that's some movie magic and it's one of the most awesome characters when i visited the set i saw the animatronic version of this and i, I didn't know at that point it was going to be in the film for sure so they kind of surprised me and they showed me this i said yes you're bringing back the dilophosaurus you know, one of the best dinosaurs of all time in the franchise so there's some great action scenes in the film with uh, this monster uh oh. Oh yes, I'm here. They're saying don't move. Is this a T Rex or another dinosaur that's after them? No. <clears throat> the T Rex, of course, it wouldn't be a Jurassic film if there was no T Rex. So there is a T Rex in the film, but there is another dinosaur, one that rivals T Rex, and that's the one that they needed me to pronounce when they called me from the set. That's the Giganotosaurus. Uh, and the real Giganotosaurus, uh, it comes from Argentina. Uh, and it, it was it was big. Uh, it, it was about the same size as T-Rex. Maybe it was a little bit longer than T-Rex. It seems like it didn't weigh quite as much. T-Rex maybe weighed a, a ton or so more. It was just a bit stockier. But by and large, this was another meat-eating dinosaur that would have looked like and behaved pretty similar to T-Rex. This is ultimate apex predator type of stuff. So in this film, you know, you have the two apex predators the T-Rex and the Giganotosaurus. As you can imagine, chaos will ensue. <laughs> I won't give away the storyline, but when two um, super alpha apex predators go at it, there's going to be some action. Yeah, I really can't wait to see it. Um, I wanted to ask you this. This movie franchise has been going on since the early 90s. What do you think it's done to, to dinosaur interest in people who have seen it? Well, I think it's been huge. I think really it's it's the most important thing that's happened to paleontology, at least in the in the last you know half a century. Um, the the Jurassic World franchise, and I've always been a fan of it, so being able to work on it is really a, a dream. Um, but but I think uh, the franchise as a whole has just brought dinosaurs to a massive international audience, and it's brought a new vision of dinosaurs. When the first film came out in 93, I remember seeing it in the cinema, I was nine years old, I was there with my dad and with my brothers, and I mean, the special effects were so far beyond anything that had ever been done in a film by that point, and those dinosaurs were so realistic. They were so different from the ones that, you know, were in the books in the library and in the school lessons and, and so on. I mean, these dinosaurs seemed real. They seemed like real animals, and, and the world saw that. And then as the franchises continued, you know, hundreds of millions of people have seen these films. And that's led to more museums putting on more dinosaur exhibits, more universities putting on more dinosaur courses. That's led to more jobs for paleontologists. As I mentioned earlier, there has been this direct funding of, of research digs and, and, and projects from 
proceeds from the film. So all in all, it's had a great influence. Um, and, and I think a lot of us, probably me included, you know, wouldn't be here, wouldn't be a paleontologist, uh, wouldn't have a job or wouldn't have even ever kind of had an entry into the field, any, any reason, any inspiration to go into the field if it wasn't for Jurassic Park. And I have colleagues from all over the world. You know, it's not just like little boys growing up, you know, in the middle of America like me. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, young boys, young girls all over the world. I have colleagues from China, from Argentina. I mean, they, they say that, that these films are what inspired them to become paleontologists. And now they're the ones out there that are making the new discoveries and pushing our field forward. That's so great. I can't wait to see what dinosaurs pop up in the next movies whenever they may come out. Well, so that was Lauren, Steve chatting. Oh, man. So I don't know if you guys have seen the reviews yet come out. It's not great. I just reloaded Rotten Tomatoes. It was a 38 this morning. It went down to 37. Now it's a 36. Seems like people are not happy with this movie as much. Uh, here's one review from Neil Ponda Parade. Um, <laughs> CGI dinosaurs just don't feel as awesome anymore. Versus this review that says the visual effects are amazing. So I kind of feel like if you're here for the dinosaurs, it's gonna be fine. Like I, we know the last movie was a bit uh, of more of a fun watch, right? Drink every time you hear something uh, silly being said, but like, I mean, yeah, suspension of disbelief. Yeah, guys, we don't have dinosaurs here. Like, let's, let's be clear. This is more cool to feature all these new dinosaurs that we have not talked about. And like both Ken and Steve said, it makes people more interested in dinosaurs and, you know, history and science and all that stuff. And uh, I mean, so this is one review that I'm a little concerned by. I, I did see a lot of mention of locusts. Um, I, I don't know if you guys uh, recall me in other live streams. I'm not a fan of bugs. I'm already planning to go see this movie soon. So, um, but we do have, you know, coverage on live science about locusts. So I will be reading up on that to make sure that I can in fact handle it. Um, so I wanted to feature some questions. First of all, Mac has read Steve's book. That's great. He does have a new book, um, uh, The Rise and Reign of, of the Mammals. So please, you know, check that out. Um, but then we also got a comment from uh, Javier. Are there air sacs in the new movie like in the new Planet Earth series? Now, I believe that Javier is referring to Prehistoric Planet, which is on Apple Plus TV. We have covered this before. Um, and in fact, we did get uh, Ken talking about this. If I can just load this part of the interview, that was, it was a pretty cool bit quite a long scene of Dreadnoughtus. Uh, here they are. Um, yeah, the fight scene. There was a fight scene uh, in this, um, this territorial battle between males. And I, I think this was actually kind of based on our science because um, what we found with the two Dreadnoughtus individuals is that the, the much larger one, the 65 ton one, was osteologically, that means its bones, was osteologically quite young. You might even think of it as a, as a teenager who was growing rapidly at the time of its death. Whereas the one that we found that was one third smaller, uh, osteologically, was much, much older. And so where do you find this in animals today, where you find older, smaller individuals and younger, bigger individuals? That's in species where you have um, sexual dimorphism, where the, the two sexes are of different sizes. And usually that happens where you have male dominated sexual sexual selection, which means that uh, two alpha males are going to compete with each other to con control a territory or a group of females. There's also female dominated sexual selection. That's where you see the males showing off with all kinds of colors and doing fancy tricks and buying Corvettes and things like that. Um, and so with Dreadnoughtus, we have just a hint, you know, that we have sexual dimorphism and then kind of a hint based on a hint that maybe it was male dominated sexual selection. And that's what you are seeing here. And then- um, uh, These air sacs, we gotta talk about these air sacs. Yeah, though. let's talk about the air sacs. What do you think about that? Well, the air sacs are kind of hard to miss. Um, I have to tell you that there is zero evidence that Dreadnoughtus had 
air sacs. Uh, these are pneumatic gular pouches like a grouse would have today. Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible, but we don't have any evidence that they do have that. Now, I was told by the consultant on the show that um, they wanted to find a way to illustrate the fact that extinct animals must have had amazing soft tissue structures that will never be preserved in the fossil record, which is certainly true. If we only knew elephants from their skeletons, I probably wouldn't really know what an elephant looked like. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this is an example of a hypothetical feature that maybe we're missing completely in the fossil record that could have existed. Did they specifically have this? Probably not. Is it impossible that they had this? No, it's also not, but we don't have any evidence of it. What we do have though, is we have their cervical vertebrae, cervical vertebrae, and um, the cervical vertebrae are very pneumatic, meaning that they have a system of air tubes and air bladders um, that invade the bone over the lifetime of the animal. So the, the bone becomes more honeycombed with air over time, making it very light, but still retaining most of the strength. Because if you have a 40 foot long neck, right? A 40 foot long lever, you don't wanna put a lot of weight at the end of that lever. So they have these very lightly built pneumatic necks, which I guess gave them the idea, okay, there's, there's air in the neck, there's a lot of air in the neck. Why not something like, a, like male grouses in the breeding season that have these pneumatic cooler pouches that pop out like that. Thinking of a story of Dreadnoughtus. <laughs> I know it's always interesting to draw inspiration from modern creatures. There he goes. But, um, I guess we'll have to hold out for any more fossil or soft tissue preservation. Yeah, I, you know, there's certain things that we're just never going to know and we kind of have to live with that disappointment. Um, but there are a lot of soft tissue features that extinct creatures have that we're just never going to find. Um, we can make inferences about them. Sometimes we can do that from um, molecular work with modern creatures. We can look at the DNA from, from groups of related creatures and, and kind of figure out where that trait must have started. Occasionally you get um, soft tissue structures preserved if you have very, uh, uh, clay deposits that can preserve that kind of resolution, but that's very rare. And I don't see that scenario happening for big things like sauropods. That happens for little things like birds. Um, and then, you know, there's always the promise of molecular paleontology where, you know, we routinely cover now, we cover um, blood vessels and blood cells and proteins from dinosaurs and other extinct creatures. Um, a few DNA bases have been recovered. Is it possible we'll have a genome of a dinosaur of a lion avian dinosaur in the future. I don't know, it's a, it's a pretty high mountain to climb, but I can't say that it's impossible. So there you go. Air sex in prehistoric planet, zero evidence, zero evidence. Um, all this is, at least we know things because of the fossils. So obviously like the more these paleontologists find, the more they tell us and the more we tell you. So that's kind of how this goes. But, um, you know, I, I uh, started watching a little bit of Prehistoric Planet and I found it a little bit too phantasmal for, uh, for what I was looking for. And so I guess maybe I'll go into Jurassic World Dominion with a little bit more fanciful. Um, here's another review on it. Instead of a fitting swan song to a successful franchise, it becomes a creative misfire. Uh, Katie, I, I mean, that's, that sounds that sounds tough, and um, you know uh, apparently you know Laura Dern, which I mean guys, we get to see Laura Dern and Sam Neill again and Jeff Goldblum. Like these are like that's why we're going for the nostalgia. But um, <laughs> Shakus, this never gets old, and <laughs> I'm sure if you were seeing real dinosaurs in real life, it probably wouldn't get old. So I'll let that slide, but. Um, Finally, it's like satisfies the fan who comes for the dino fights and the nostalgia while leaving the rest of the audience cold. And I'm curious, who else is seeing this movie that isn't into dino fights and isn't into nostalgia? Like, I just don't know where the, the genre lies otherwise. But um, thank you for joining us. That's our live stream on Jurassic World Minion. Maybe we'll review it uh, after this weekend when more people have actually seen it and not just the critics. Um, 
Uh, if you want that, let us know. Um, in the meantime, check out lifescience.com where we live science. Thanks guys.